Okay, welcome to the den. We're going to have a new class on the book of Ephesians. So we're going to look at Ephesians at a glance. Uh, today, we're just going to get an overview, get an introduction, get a background, uh, mainly the author, who the apostle is, the authority in which he had the power to write it, and then see how he speaks about Christ, the anointed one, and the anointed ones, which are the Christians. <coughs> So the first thing we need to understand is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you, peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wrote to expand the horizon of his readers so that they might understand better dimensions of God's eternal purpose and grace and come to appreciate high goals God has for the church. So he, he has written this so that they can understand that God saved by grace. But also his high goal is to understand what is the purpose of the church. R.C. Sproul on the book of Ephesians says this, quote, he says, when Christ redeemed us from sin and death, he incorporated all believers unto his body. It is therefore critical to understand the nature and the calling of the church that we might be effective members of one body that is called to bear witness to God's grace in this world. End of quote. So let's go over and let's see what the theme and the literature of this structure. The first half of Ephesians lists that believers heavenly position in Christ Jesus the adoption, the redemption, the inheritance, the power, the life, the grace, the citizenship, and the love of Christ. There are no imperatives in Ephesians chapter 1 through chapter 3, which focus on the divine gifts of the believers. But then when we get to Ephesians chapter 4 through 6, include 35 directives that speaks of the believer's responsibility to conduct themselves according to the call. That's why when you see Ephesians 4, it says, walk worthy of the vocation which you have been called. Thus, the two main divisions of the book are this, the position of the Christian found in chapter 1 through 3, and then the practice of the Christian. The wonderful news of salvation in Ephesians is directed towards the goal of the praise of his glory, which is found in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12, just as well as Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14. That word glory occurs eight times and refers to the exceeding excellency of God's love, his wisdom, and his power. God's glory is particularly revealed in his commitment to build, what, a glorious and mature ministering church, not having spot or wrinkle. That's found in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27. Notice it says, the heavenly character of believers calling in stress in Ephesians 1, 3. Ephesians 1, 3 says, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Although previously we were dead in sin, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 through 3 tells us, the Christian has been raised with Christ and seated in heavenly places. You can look at Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. This heavenly call in turn provides that the means and the empowerment of believers Life of obedience here on the earth, as found in Ephesians chapter 4. But we see here in verse 1 through 2, we just read about this greeting. Notice it says, Paul, an apostle. So that tells us who the author is, which is Paul wrote, the, the, uh, wrote to the Ephesians, the church at Ephesus. But notice what Paul is called, Paul, an apostle. What does the word apostle mean? The word apostle means sent one, sent one. So here, Paul, he's the author. He's an apostle. He is one who has been sent by God to proclaim the word of God. 
He is one who has been sent by God to proclaim the word of God. So if he has been sent by God to preach the word of God, he's not only an apostle and an author, but he has the authority to write to the church at Ephesus. He said, Paul, an apostle of what? Jesus Christ by the will of God. Here is a unique authority from God to write the New Testament. But notice here, he shares not only authority, apostles, and the author, but he also talk about the anointed one and the anointed ones. Because he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, watch this, to the saints who are at Ephesus. So you see that one, to the saints who are at Ephesus, they are anointed ones. Everybody that's in the body of Christ is anointed. Now, there's a false sense that everyone would say if somebody sings well or preach well or they emotionally move, that that's the anointing. The anointing is the Holy Spirit who empowers us to do the will of God. And that's why it says to the saints who are at Ephesus and are faithful, watch this, in Christ. If you're in Christ, you're a part of the anointed ones. But who is the anointed one? Notice what it says in Ephesians 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, watch this, of Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and are faithful in Christ. Christ is the anointed one, and he is the Messiah. Ephesus, it was a port of a city of the western Asia Minor at the mouth of the river. Therefore, it had a port that made the city rich, meaning import and export. This is why Paul speaks of the riches of, of his, talking about God's grace in Ephesians 1, 7. The Greeks identified the deities with their own city. Ephesus had an ancient fertility god named Diana, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This is why Paul tells them to bless God or worship him for being supreme over making all creation and salvation. That's what Ephesians uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 shares with us. The church begun by Priscilla and Aquila was later firmly established by Paul. After Paul left, guess who he left? Timothy. He left Timothy at Ephesus. Timothy pastored the con congregation. But we don't see nothing about the church at Ephesus until 30 years later in the book of Revelation. Christ gave the apostle John a letter for the church indicating his people had left their first love. That's in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 through 7. Now, in this last bit of time that we have left, I just want to talk about the division of this book. And so that if you want to go back and you want to study it, uh, you can study it in smaller portions and break it down. Now, I remind you that I said the first part is, there's two parts of the book. The first part is the position of, of the Christian. That's found in Ephesians chapter 1 all the way to the end of Ephesians chapter 3. Now the first part of that is the praise for redemption. The praise for redemption. That's in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 1 through 14. Now up under the praise for redemption, the first we see in verses 1 through 2 is the salutation or the greetings from Paul. Then as it is being uh, is broke down in verses 3 through 6, chosen by the Father. Then in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 through 12, redeemed by the Spirit. Then we see in verses 13 and 14, sealed by the, by the Spirit. And at the end of all of those, it, it, it constantly reminds us to the praise of His glory. So therefore, in verses 1 through 14, we see the praise of His redemption. But second, at the end of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 through 23, we see a prayer for revelation. Paul says to open up to him the wisdom and the understanding. So we saw the praise for redemption, the prayer for revelation, but starting in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, all the way to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 13, we see the position of the Christian. First, we see in Ephesians Chapter 2, verse 1 through 10, the Christian position individually who is dead and trespasses in sin. Second, we see the Christian position corporately, which starts in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, 
and follow all the way to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 13. So we saw the praise of his redemption in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 through 14. We saw the praise for Revelation, Ephesians 1, verse 15 through 23. Then we just got done seeing the position of the Christian, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, all the way to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 13. But also we see here Paul began to pray again. Now, first he prayed for revelation, but now the prayer for realization, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 through 21. So that concludes part one, the position of the Christian. Now there's a second part of the Bible. So that first part was what we call indicatives, and that is the simple act of what God has done. Now when we get to Ephesians chapter 4, we see imperatives. Imperatives are commands. In the Bible, anytime you see that God tells us to repent, it's not until something that he has done. So when he does something first, a simple act, that is, he says, repent and believe. Well, before we repent and believe, he allow us to be born again and give us a new spirit and a new heart. And therefore, when we have the Holy Spirit, we are now able to put our faith in God and then repent. Therefore, the command to repent. So here in Ephesians chapter 4, we see imperatives. So the second part is, first one was the position of the Christian. Part two of the book, the practice of the Christian. Ephesians chapter 4 through Ephesians chapter 6. First, we see the unity in the church. Ephesians 4 verse 1 through 6. So Ephesians 4 verse 1 through 3, we see the exhortation to unity, the exhortation to unity. And then two, we see the explanation of unity, and that's found in verses four through six. First, in verse one through three, the exhortation to unity. Second, the explanation of unity is found in verses four through six. But third, we see in verse 11 through, a, I'm, I'm sorry, Ephesians four, verse seven through 11, we see the means for unity talking about the gifts. He gave some apostles, pastors, teachers, and evangelists for the unifying and the building of the church. Now, that was at the first century that he gave apostles and prophets. But now, in these latter days, he gave us pastors, teachers, which is one thing. If you're preaching, you should be teaching. And if you're teaching, you should be preaching. Because one of the qualifications for a pastor is apt to teach. And then, last of all, he gave us evangelists or missionaries to equip us to do the work of the ministry. And then also he tells us what is the purpose of these gifts in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12 through 16. And that is to mature us until we grow into the full body of Christ. So in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 6, we saw the unity in the church. But secondly, we see the holiness in life. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, all the way to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Notice the first thing we see in holiness of life is put off the old man, Ephesians 4, verse 17 through 22. But also, we see the putting on of the new man in Ephesians 4, verse 23 through 29. One of the things I like about this book is that Paul don't just say stop stealing. He commands us to stop stealing, putting off the old man, but then he gives us an example of a new man is the work of your hand, but not only just work of your hand just to have money for yourself, but he says look for opportunities to share. And that's how the grace of God is towards us, and God wants us to be the same way. So the holiness of life, putting off the old man in Ephesians 4, verse 17 through 22. Secondly, putting on the new man, Ephesians 4, verse 23 through 29. But third, grieve not the Holy Spirit. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4, verse 30, but it also goes into Ephesians chapter 5, verse 12. But also it says, not only grieve not the Holy Spirit, put on the new man, put off the old man, but walk as children of the light. Ephesians 5, verse 13 through 17. And then last of all, in the holiness of life, be filled with the Spirit. And that's found in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 through 21. So we saw the holiness in life, but now we want to see the responsibility in the home and at work. And it starts in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, and it stops at Ephesians 6, 
verse 9. But before we get to the responsibility in the home and the work, we notice that in this holy life, the last one we left off, you must be filled with the Spirit. And one of the things about being filled, we must be constantly being filled. So what is synonymous with being filled with the Spirit? Colossians says, let the word of God dwell in you richly. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 is to study to show thyself approving to God that a workman need not to be ashamed. There are two cross references in the disciples then. Hermeneutics to homiletics is a good resource. And then we also went over bibliology. Those are two resources that you can go back in the playlist that we've already made for some reference if you want to know how to do an inductible Bible study. But, but here we see the responsibility in the home and at work. The first we see the wives in, in verses in, uh, Ephesians 5, verse 22 through 24, is to submit to their husbands. And then second, we see husbands are to love their wives, Ephesians 5, verse 25 to 23. So wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. But third, children, obey your parents. That's Ephesians 6, verse 1 through 4. But also in that, that the parents have a responsibility to not to provoke their children, but also to raise them up in the fear and in the ammunition of the Lord. And then last of all, not only do we see children obey your parents, husband love your wives, wives submit to your husband, but also we see the service on the job as in our day, employee and employer. So here we saw the unity in the church, the holiness in life, the responsibility in the home and the work. And then last of all, we want to see here the conduct and the conflict. And the Bible says the first thing is to put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God. And then second of all, we are to pray for boldness. Putting on the whole armor of God is in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 17. Praying for boldness, Ephesians 6, verse 18 through 20. And then last of all, Paul concludes his letter in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 21 through 24. Well, I would like to read Ephesians um, chapter 1, verse 3 through 14 to show you the blessedness that God has given us. It says, Blessed be the God of our Father, and Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be wholly blameless before him. And love, he predestined us for the adoption through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he hath blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his, through his blood." the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he hath lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose which he has set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Verse 11 says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him who also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, and believed in him, was sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire the possession of it, to the praise of his glory. As long as we are in Christ, verse 3 say, I am blessed. Verse 4 says, I am chosen. Verse 5 say, I am predestined and adopted. Verse 6 says that as long as I'm in Christ, I am accepted. Verse 7 says, I'm redeemed. Verse 7 also says, I'm forgiven. Verse 8 and 9 say, I have been enlightened. Verse 11 says, I've been given an inheritance. Verse 13 says, I have been sealed. And then in verse 14, it says, I am assured by this guarantee. But all of this is to the praise of his glory. If you have not come to Jesus Christ, God has fully laid out the plan of salvation. How the father thought it and came up with election. How the son 
bought it with redemption, and now the Holy Spirit is rotten or, or, or working in our lives that you may come. If you don't believe in a death, burial, and resurrection, there is no other way to heaven. But the only way to heaven, Jesus said, he is the way, the truth, and the life. Come to Jesus Christ.